So let's move on to talk about the, um, I guess, the spoiled brats, really, of um, Columbia University and some of the other uh, elite US universities who are protesting. I, I want to show a clip of, I think, the archetypal protester. First of all, we're saying that they're obligated to provide food to students who pay for a meal plan here. I mean, it's crazy to say because we're on an Ivy League campus, but this is like basic humanitarian aid. <laughs> <laughs> People please have a glass of water. <laughs> <laughs> so that was uh, Johanna King Slutsky speaking before the police uh, raided the occupation, demanding humanitarian aid. I mean, does she think she's actually living in, in Gaza? Or something. There, there was, I, I saw someone say this on Twitter. It's like they're kind of cosplaying as like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> as a press garzons or something like that. It's really it's ridiculous, but also it's incredibly unseemly. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that clip is fascinating because of the fact that um, it really speaks to the entitlement of mm. these protesters, the extent to which they really expect to be indulged, even to the point where you know they were occupying this building, Hamilton Hall. They they broke their way in. They were barricading the doors. Yeah. You know, this this was full blown occupation, civil disobedience. This yeah. wasn't a peaceful protest. Um, and yet they expected the university to provide them with refreshments whilst they were doing and so. And smashing windows as well. Exactly. Like they yeah. were, they, it was, it was such a bizarre spectacle, <laughs> but you know, we, we've spoken a lot um, on the last podcast about the rank anti-Semitism, which has been expressed at a lot of these protests mm. um, at the gates of Columbia um, and the really unsettlingly high tolerance that a lot of these protesters have for that anti-Semitism, even if they're not directly engaging in it themselves always. Um, but at the same time, there's this other side to it, which is this babyish desire to be indulged. And mm. I think it does speak to the fact that um, a lot of, over the recent years, a lot of these kind of camp, supposed campus radicals have been indulged to a certain extent. Yeah. Um, and it, I think it really came to a head when the NYPD come and clear Hamilton Hall, which is that you saw this reaction which was almost like it was bizarre, strange, surprising that having mounted this occupation that that might come with certain consequences. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you saw students being interviewed on cable news saying that this is a blow to freedom of speech as if freedom of speech just gives you free reign to smash windows and so on. Mm. And I thought that was really striking. I mean, we've, we've already talked about it before, but there is obviously the free speech question over these protests, particularly in the crackdown that happened at the University of Texas at Austin, really questionable a liberal attempt to crack down on peaceful protest but at the same time if you're engaging in civil disobedience you should expect consequences that's the whole point yeah you're breaking the rules and that's what gives it its power is yeah. that you're supposed to say i care about this so much that i'm willing to risk arrest mm. the fact that they were almost surprised to see that forcibly breaking into a university building and smashing things up came with those consequences i think spoke to that level of sort of uh, upper middle class self-indulgence that these kids are, have been brought up in. Um, so much so that they expect to be able to engage in not only anti-Semitic conduct, but violent conduct and basically get a pat on the head for doing so. Yeah, the, be on the right side of history, I guess. Well, I, I think what puts the, like really captures the protest is this like very strange mix of this complete entitlement, as mm -hmm. you say, the anti-Semitic element that you guys discussed last week. And then this like really creepy kind of herd-like authoritarianism that mm. they display that I find to be the signal, one of the signal features of the protest where they like all link arms and like autonomons kind of like march along that that they all wear masks, cover their faces. They're yeah. like, there's no, like this point you're making about civil disobedience it involves standing up, taking responsibility for something saying, look, we're, we're not going to put up with this yeah. because we believe it's wrong. That I think comes with an expectation that you should actually stand up that instead of hiding yourself and not saying anything. They all speak in this like unison chanting. And yeah. there's something really creepy and heard like that mm -hmm. speaks to the fact that this is kind of less a, a, a kind of courageous organized political movement and more something that people are kind of jammed into and feel that they just have to go, go along with a, a particular agenda to some degree. And you put all these ingredients together in the protest and you get something that, as, as, as you say, is very far from being a kind of free speech issue. Yeah. It's very far from being a kind of principled identification with, if you think of the plight of the Palestinians, it's very far from this. It's instead very much more re reflective of the kind of their own coddled mm. nature as students who've never really been challenged properly mm. and this instinctive kind of self-identification self-hatred with the place that they're in with america in the west and that's yeah. why the i mean that's why the american flag has become a, almost a flashpoint in these mm. protests which is that it, for them getting rid of the american flag and putting the palestinian one in its place is like the most important it's the getting rid of the american flag that's yeah. the most important bit the palestinian thing is almost kind almost of separate yeah. second to it Definitely. And in fact, you know, as you say, you know, the conformism or the enforced conformism is really striking. I mean, there's a clip we've got actually of people just not being allowed onto campus if they don't support the protests. 
This is what they do. I'm a UCLA student. I deserve to go here. We pay tuition. This is our school. And they're not letting me walk in. If you don't have the right politics, you're not on the mm -hmm. list, basically. Yeah. It's, you know, or if you're a Jewish student. Yeah, that, if you're Jewish. I think that was at UCLA, but you're yes. seeing very similar things at various different American universities. And it just rubbishes this idea that um, that this is free speech that we're talking about in many mm. of these instances. Free speech does not give you a right to commit violence. It doesn't give you a right to harass and discriminate and stop Jewish students from moving around university campus. This is obvious. Yeah. But they've been able to sort of blur this line, I think, just because of the fact that, as has been the case in a lot of American elite higher education for a long time is that they've been they've been indulged they've been encouraged they've been told that they are basically on the right side of history um and i think it's it's interesting and dispiriting that you've got so many of the kind of older generation of sort of 60s radicals who have been indulging them in that comparison yeah so of course like hamilton hall was occupied in 1968 in opposition to the vietnam war but also there was this row over a gymnasium the, that columbia were building in harlem that students alleged was basically going to be de facto uh, segregated. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the only thing that's similar is that they both occupied that building. Yeah. I mean, in terms of what they were occupying it for, first mm -hmm. of all, I don't think those students expected to get a soft hand from the police, no. you know, <laughs> which is certainly what happened. About 700 of them were arrested. <laughs> they wanted some meal, for, you know, hot meals. To no, exactly. To, there was no um, mention of um, meal plans as far as I can work out from the historical record. <laughs> but also, what were they protesting about? They were protesting about the war and mm -hmm. they were protesting against racism. Whereas yeah. what these students are doing is luxuriating in racism, um, being incredibly tolerant of racism. One character I found out about this week is um, Kamani James, I think mm. his name is, um, who was one of the leaders of this protest, was being interviewed by CNN about their demands and so on. But it's been going through a disciplinary process at Columbia because of the fact that he put out these videos of himself talking about how Zionists don't deserve to live and kind of fantasizing about getting into a deadly confrontation with them. He fights to kill, he says. Exactly. Really? I mean, he doesn't look like he's ever had a fight no. in his life. But nevertheless, but the fact that yeah. he's saying these things and the fact that excuses are being made for them and people who should know better are saying anti-Semitism, what anti-Semitism are you talking yeah, about, yeah, yeah. is chilling. But I think we have to also get on a bit to the kind of reaction to the yes, protests definitely. as well. And the, I mean, we've seen various different kinds of reactions. You maybe don't support pitch battles between different, mm. between pro and anti uh, protest camps or whatever. Although that is a, when you take the law into your own hands and violate the law, this is a, you, you have to kind of expect that maybe people won't take this line down. But in some ways, I think, and again, referring to that almost battle over the American flag and that group of fraternity kids mm. who uh, came and kind of stood and made a point of defending the, the, the reinsertion of the American flag. I think what the protests represent, maybe they're over now, maybe the police seem to have moved in across a lot of America, but this represents, I think, a bit of an eye-opening moment for lots of Americans that what's going on in Israel and the reaction to it at home is, is not just about a kind of simple conflict between Israel and Palestine or Ismail and ha Hamas, right? Mm. But what's happened at home, this sense that they really hate everything American, everything Western, that there's this kind of fixation on the Jews as the embodiment of, of white evil. And that, that I think happening in America on American campuses has really opened people's eyes to the fact that there is a kind of real culture war, real civilizational battle uh, yeah. at play here between those who defend some of the legacies that are associated with America as imperfect as they might be and those who s kind of completely want to overthrow them join in as we saw in kind of mass uh, Islamic prayer rituals which like fine to pray but there was something kind of again conformist a bit herd like a bit weird about all of that and that this has been reflected I think so Trump has really changed his tune on the Israel uh, conflict over the last few days, you've seen him kind of maybe he said no longer supports a two state solution. You say that he thinks uh, uh, anti Semitism is a really massive problem across mm. uh, America. And he's reading the mood music, he's listening to the mood music, and something has changed in America now, I think, and maybe more broadly, that it's no longer just to say that this is a conflict over there that's kind yeah. of got nothing to do with us. There's some real battles closer to home. Mm. And it and it didn't start with this war either, I no. think, is also yeah, the one. Because there's been some kind of critics of campus cancel culture have been looking at this slightly aghast and thinking you know just under 10 years ago we we're all laughing at the Yale snowflakes who went into like open revolt mm. because an academic sent around an email saying maybe you guys should chill out about offensive <laughs> Halloween costumes yeah so we've gone from you know babyish offense taking to pro Hamas in the space, yeah. <laughs> space of nine years you know how has that happened but I, I think as um as a lot of us have been writing about and talking about is that this is this is clearly on a kind of continuum there's yeah. clearly a relationship between students who believe that all of the fundamental values of the West are rotten, mm. um, who believe speech is violence, end up yeah. engaging in violence, and who've been reared on this identity politics, which has now been kind of applied to geopolitics with depressingly predictable anti-Semitic 
consequences. So um, I don't think anyone should be surprised that this has happened. And th this is not just a visceral humanitarian reaction to the yeah. scenes that they're seeing in the news. Definitely not.